Well, good afternoon and welcome to CoachX Live from the Institute of Coaching. My name is Jeffrey Hull. I'm the Executive Director at the Institute of Coaching, and I want to welcome everyone from around the world. So it's good morning or good afternoon or good evening, um, depending upon where you are. Say hello in the comments. Hopefully the comments section will work this time because <laughs> it didn't work last time. Um, but my tech expert, Austin, has told me that if he has trouble with our comments, he's going to put them in the private chat. So I'll try to see as many of you as I can. Um, I am very excited to be here today with a good friend of the Institute of Coaching and my colleague at uh, Marshall Goldsmith's 100 Coaches. Todd Cherchus is with us today. He is the CEO and co-founder of, and I love the company name, <laughs> Todd, Big Blue Gumball, um, a New York City management consulting firm that specializes in leadership development, public speaking, and executive coaching. He's a founding partner of the Global Institute for Thought Leadership and an award-winning professor at both uh, in leadership at both NYU and at Columbia. He was recently nominated as a finalist for the 2021 Thinkers 50 Distinguished Achievement Award for Leadership. He's ranked number 35 on 2021 Thinkers 360 list of top 50 leaders and influencers. And most importantly, he has a really great book that we're going to talk about today called Visual Leadership, Leveraging the Power of Visual Thinking in Leadership and Life from Simon & Schuster. I'm a huge fan of this book. I'm a huge fan of this work. And um, I think that it's a really interesting topic for coaches and leaders to be shifting their mindset in this new paradigm workplace. We are calling maybe a hybrid workplace, a virtual workplace, but definitely um, an accelerating uh, environment that we're all um, dealing with today. So, oh, look, the comments are working. Yay, thank you, Austin. So hello to folks from, oh my God, India, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, London, South Africa. You have a global audience, Todd. So welcome is, to the Institute of Coaching. That is exciting. I see some good friends, Andrew, and uh, and some other good friends out here. So it's nice to, nice to be here with you. Great to have you. So I think the very first place to start is what is visual leadership and how did you come to do research and develop your thought leadership in this space? Sure. Well, visual leadership is very simply the application of visual thinking to the practice of leadership. So, so often in leadership and in business, we, we think in terms of words and numbers, but visual leadership is about thinking in pictures and visual communication is about communicating with pictures. So. Um, the title of my book, which a lot of people don't even know this, talk about visual thinking, is that there's one single shared capital L in the title. So people don't even notice that very often because uh, Thoreau said, it's not what we look at, but what we see that really matters. Right, right. And so often we look at things, but we don't really see them, right? We don't know this certain thing. So a big part of visual leadership is looking backward, the fact that who we are and how we lead is a result of the lens through which we see the world. And then very often when we talk about leadership, we talk about leadership vision, right? Someone being a visionary leader. So it's right. about looking backward, but it's also about looking forward. It's about looking through the microscope down into the details, but also looking through a telescope out into the future and even looking through a kaleidoscope and seeing the world in all its colors. So those are just a few of the concepts behind visual leadership. Yeah, I love that. I know it's, it's interesting you mentioned the name and the title and the way it's set up, because I think when I first saw your book, I thought it was visionary leadership because, of mm. course, we automatically tend to go there. And then when I started reading it, I realized I was actually doing the very thing that you pointed to, which is that I was being very narrative driven as opposed to and rational as opposed to actually aesthetics yeah. and seeing through my eyes. And this is really powerful because it's a paradigm shift for many yeah. of us. Right. And it's also access to a whole different way of being creative and innovative. So. Give us a little background. I know, you know, you and I have spoken about your creative background in the media and but I'm sure people are interested to learn a little bit about how you came to this theme. Sure. Um, well, 
as I talk about in my TED talk on the power of visual thinking, when I was a kid, people would say, Todd, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I'd say, I want to be Superman. And I'd say, you know, again, we were all like growing up in, in that era of putting on our mother's dish towel and flying around the house. Um, and then people would say, well, if you can't be Superman, what's your backup plan? And uh, as a kid, I said, all right, then Batman. So those were my two career aspirations as a kid. But then as I grew older, I realized I couldn't uh, be either of those superheroes. So I decided I wanted to go into television. So I worked, I got my um, bachelor's degree in English literature from State University of New York at Albany, got my master's degree in communication from there, worked in advertising for Ogilvy and Mather for a year, and then packed my bags and my cape and flew out to Hollywood. And I spent <laughs> 10 years uh, working in the TV industry. I worked for Michael Nesmith of the Monkees, who baby boomers know, but my millennial students and, and younger do not tend to know who he is. I worked for Aaron Spelling. I worked for Columbia Pictures. I was in comedy at Disney and drama at CBS. So I spent the early years of my career working in the TV industry. And one of the recurring themes was dysfunctional cultures and toxic bosses, right? Oh, wow. So, yeah. um, so that kind of I, it made me think, am I going to have to spend my whole career working for these insane, crazy people? And then after 10 years in LA, including working for a few theme park companies as well. I moved back to New York, didn't know what I wanted to do, and ended up just fell into a job at a management training company. And doing that job, I had to read all these management leadership books and the light bulb went off. Visual. The light bulb went off. Um, and uh, I realized that managing and leading is an art and a science. In fact, I think in your book, Flex, you may even have that in your subtitle. Oh, that's true. Training. <laughs> of leadership, right? So I always love that. Like, when is it a science? When is it an art, right? There's a saying, you manage people, you manage processes, you lead people. So it's that balance. So, that, so that's basically, long story short, that's the foundation of my work. It's about thinking visually. It's about storytelling, using metaphor, frameworks, and just seeing things through a different lens. So those are some of the, I'll stop right there, but that's my early part of my career that led me into the management and leadership field. That's great. I mean, it, it's amazing to me that you were able to parlay what was probably a challenging experience into a creative outlet like coaching, like leadership development, and actually pull from the core creativity of what those wonderful folks that are not always functional in Hollywood do well. Yeah. So, my book is dedicated first to my wife, secondly to my parents, and thirdly to all the horrible bosses without whom the rest of my career would not have been possible. So um, yeah, well, it wasn't funny and fun at the time. One of the stories I tell is about my boss at a TV network, and I won't mention which one, but I had a C, a B, and an S in its name. Um, I was sitting at my desk, and I felt something whip by my head, and she threw a box of pens at me because they were not the ones she wanted. So it's like that was like the kind of insane environment I worked in. And people think, oh, that's like a scene from a movie, but it literally was. And I, I actually kept an abuse log because I had entries every single day. And just as a sanity check, I'm like, is this normal? To, to be treated like this. And um, and people say, why did you stay? And I was like, you know, early in your career, my dream was to work in television. I finally ended up at a TV network. Unfortunately, I had to deal with that insanity. Well, I can relate. As, yeah. I've shared, as I've shared with you, those of us that grew up for, in our corporate experience in New York yeah. and the management consulting and the Wall Street environments, we've yeah. seen all of it and worse. So, yeah, so, so. Anyway, I just want to uh, remind folks that if you're interested in learning more about how visual coaching and visual leadership are used in practice and you have questions, please put them in the chat box and we'll try to get to a few of your questions before the end of our time together. But translate for me, Todd, how you use this work when you're trying to get leaders to be more effective in today's workplace. Yeah, well, just to go back for a second. When I got that job at that management training company and started reading all these leadership management leadership books, um, I didn't know anything about the field. And I always was a, I always said I'm a three B's kind of guy by nature, a behind the scene, back of the room, behind the scenes bookworm. I am not. I'm an extreme introvert, even though I talk loud and fast because I'm from New York. It's not, you know, um, but so I never in a mil million years envisioned myself being in front of the room, teaching, training, presenting. So that was a huge leap forward for me. It took many years to, to force myself and push myself to get to that point. So I ended up um, working for Dale Carnegie Training as a trainer. That's how I first got into the training field. And then I worked for a London-based company as well. And then I was hired as head of leadership development for a Wall Street company called LiquidNet, financial services Wall Street company. And I created their whole leadership institute and their whole executive coaching program. 
So that gave me my first foray into doing, actually putting all this, these ideas into action. In the course of doing that, I started developing all these models and frameworks and using all these stories. And people kept saying, you need to write a book. So after like 15 years of talking about writing a book, I finally did it. And then I ended up getting a job uh, hired by NYU and Columbia as an adjunct professor, where I teach leadership in the HR master's program at NYU. And I teach leadership for Broadway stage managers at Columbia in their MFA theater program. So um, I did my TEDx talk and then uh, and then my book came out in uh, in May of 2020. So um, all of my background was basically, and all the theories and the models and the stories and the metaphors ended up um, in my book. So it was kind of exciting to actually, after carrying around these ideas in my head all these years to be able to pick up this book and say, well, and this is just a fraction of the tools, tips and techniques that I use and the stories that I tell, but. Um, so give us some examples. Let's talk down and dirty about sure. the actual application of visual leadership in the C-suite. So when you work with executives and you're trying to get them to be as effective with their teams as possible, give me some examples of how this actually makes a difference. Sure. Well, on a practical level, I break it down to four categories, and these are not silos, but they're used interchangeably. Category one is using visual imagery and or drawing. So that could be pictures, that could be props like the light bulb I had held up, or if I'm talking about, you know, what are you curious about? I may use Curious George as a prop. Or if I talk about, you know, how we need to be more flexible and we need to bend over backwards to serve our clients. So these are examples of using visuals and metaphors and imagery to communicate ideas. So it could be picking up a pen. Um, one of the exercises I do with my executive clients is can you draw what you co your company does? And I actually have an ink article. If you Google, can you draw what your company does? You'll find the article where I have people get up at a whiteboard or flip chart and actually have to draw almost like playing Pictionary um, and actually illustrate what it is that you do and how you do it. And it kind of accesses the right brain. It kind of gets you to think more creatively and use color and kind of sketch things out so you can explain them in a way that other people will understand. So and what do you do? How do you what get do people you, to see what you're saying? What do you do when people that are highly intellectually driven and focused tell you that this is a waste of time? Yeah, well, I kind of have to trick them into it. So I start out with like a single pen and just say, yeah, write this down. You know, one example, well, category one was using um, visual imagery and, and drawing pictures. But category two, which more people gravitate towards business professionals, is using met, uh, models and frameworks. So I could get okay. people to draw a four box matrix or I could get people to draw a five level pyramid like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Once they do. Um, you know, there's that saying that we need to think outside the box, but we can't, and it's a cliche, right. but we can't think outside the box until we have something inside the box. So I help people to figure out how to draw a box, a ladder, a step ladder, you know, whatever it is, and then create some kind of framework um, so they can actually visualize what they're talking about. And if you could do that, then you start to see solutions that maybe you hadn't seen before or you hadn't thought of before. And I have a number of real world examples, including how uh, one of my single napkin sketches help one of my coaching clients solve a multi-million dollar problem in about 60 seconds. Because he had an Eastern versus Western issue in his region. And I said, well, what if instead of East and West, you divided your region into North and South? And I thought it was so obvious, I almost didn't even suggest it. And he sat back and was like, I can't believe it. That's the solution, right? But until I sketched it out and he actually saw it, and he was too close to it. You know, think about the times we're so embedded in the numbers and the conflict and the personalities that we don't right. see a solution. It wasn't until I sketched out the simple diagram that he saw, like, yes, this is going to solve my problem. Not 100%, but 90%. And that was the solution. So that's just another example of how to use napkin sketching or just you know, getting something out of your head and onto paper that enables you to see things in a way that maybe you wouldn't see otherwise. So do you think that this kind of visual work is actually accessible to do in today's virtual space? And how would you transition it? Yeah, any of these things, like right now, I could draw a four box matrix and hold it up to the screen, or we could do a shared whiteboard. Like there's all kinds of ways of doing this together. Um, so categories one and two are visual imagery and, and drawing and um, models and frameworks. Category three is using metaphor and analogy, and category four is using storytelling and humor if and when appropriate. So while the first two are more visible to the eye, the other two are more visible to the ear. I could use a metaphor and say, all right, Jeffrey, this, you know, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Let's dig a little, or let's go a little beneath the surface, right? We all know that metaphor, the tip of the iceberg. We mm -hmm. use visual language all the time. We say, you know, using nature metaphors, 
we're going to plant the seed for an idea, branch out in new directions, go out on a limb and see which ideas bear fruit, right? That's just part of our everyday language. So if we use metaphors that uh, resonate with our listener, our reader, or, or our client, we will connect the dots, which is a metaphor. We will help them to see things in a new way. So, and then storytelling, I, I just shared a couple of quick stories right here. Storytelling just brings things to life. Stories have villains, victims, and heroes, and beginnings, middles, and ends, and, and there's a quest, and then there are obstacles, and there's a, there's a resolution. So all of these are tools that I use in my coaching practice, my training practice, and my teaching. Yeah, I think this is one of the more profound aspects of what you're pointing to, because I know when I'm working with my clients around communication strategies, a lot of them tend to avoid these kinds of things. They think they just want to deliver data and be mm -hmm. rational. And what you're pointing to also is the emotional connection yeah. that you build with people when you use stories. They can actually connect emotionally and somatically so that they can actually be inspired because real inspirational communication is not data, right? Yeah. It's not facts and figures. Yeah. But I do know that many of my clients, especially in the science space, research, pharma, healthcare, are very reluctant sometimes even though they went into healthcare, for example, to save lives, which right. is an inspiring thing to talk about. But I will suggest, why don't you share a story with your people about what you're doing to take care of people? And they're, oh, they don't want to hear about that. You know, they're, we do it every day. It's not a big deal. So how do you coach in those situations where you're working with scientists or doctors or people that, or engineers, for example, yeah. people that tend to try to shy, shy away from this kind of narrative driven which can be more inspirational yeah one way to do that is to get them talking like if i even if i'm talking to a technology person or an engineer if i start to get them to share what made you go into this field or, or tell me a success story or what was the biggest mistake you ever made all of a sudden they start telling stories right so a lot of times they think oh this is we're all about the numbers and the data and the statistics but one of the things i say and just to be provocative as i say you're, the numbers mean nothing and i pause outside of the context in which they exist and the story that they tell, right? It's what's the meaning behind it. And right. I, as an example, I'll say, if I say to you, I have a 250 average, is that good or bad? Well, in baseball, it's just okay, but in bowling, it's amazing, right? So the number 250 means nothing unless you tell me where that fits in. What are you, what are you talking about? And one of the stories I tell in my book is called how my cardiologist almost gave me a heart attack because I, <laughs> I went through all my tests as those of us over 50 have to do and he came back and looking at all my numbers, he said, based on all your numbers and your test results, you have a 5% chance of having a heart attack within the next 10 years. And I almost fainted. I almost fainted, hit my head on the table and knocked myself out. But then I said, doesn't that mean that I, there's a 95% chance that I won't have a heart attack within the Yeah, 5% is great. And he said, yeah, that, he said, yeah, he said, yes, that's another way of looking at it. And I was like, yeah, you think so? So, um, so again, was he wrong with the numbers he gave? No, but was that the message he intended to deliver? Not at all, because my results were great. So that's a perfect example of how a number, if not presented and framed properly with the story attached to it, can you'll, you'll fail to get your message across. And that's what it's really about, is as leaders, we wanna inspire and motivate people and paint a picture of a better future. That's what the vision's all about. And numbers just are not that exciting, right? They're not inspirational. The numbers back it up, but we wanna paint a picture you know, Martin Luther King said, I have a dream, right? He didn't say I have an Excel spreadsheet or a business plan. So right. that's uh, the classic example of how what we're trying to do is inspire people with, with a picture of a future. And you talk about that in your book in many cases, right? Uh, you know, yeah, I mean, I think that what I talk about is the fact that, that many of the clients that I work with tend to be one extreme or another, right? They tend to be storyteller, storytellers or not storytellers. Mm -hmm. And what we need is to for people to be more agile in today's workplace and actually use all of these tools yeah. depending upon the context, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, these are all tools in our toolkit. So that's a great point. This is, if you only have one tool, sorry to keep pulling out these out, but uh, <laughs> you know the saying, if you only have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So you want to have a variety of tools in your, in your leadership toolkit and visual leadership and visual thinking is just one of them. So speaking of tools, give us an example that you would share with coaches. So we think about as coaches, we want to get our our clients to be more visual in their work. What do you recommend? What kinds of things? Yeah. 
Sure. Well, one of the things we have to do is not only be good storytellers, but be good story listeners, right? One of the things we need to do as coaches is to help pull that story out of our clients. So clients. So we need to create a psychologically safe space where they could feel vulnerable. We need to sh maybe sometimes share our stories to prime the pump. I know some coaches disagree with that, but one of the things I do, if I'm coaching someone, um, one of my models is called CAP, confidence, assertiveness, and presence, right? That's a very common thing. Um, with people who are presenting for the first time, they may lack confidence, they may feel not as assertive, and they may feel they lack presence. So even though they have the technical knowledge, they may not have the communication skills. So one of the things I work on with them is how to do that. And a real life example, one of my coaching clients was very hesitant and not doing well in his, his presentations. And I said, what's something that you're really interested in? And he had just run the, the New York Marathon. And he, he told, I said, tell me about the marathon. And he got so animated, so excited about the time and his training and the finishing and that feeling of reaching the finish line, beating his time from the previous year. I'm like, that's the passion. If you could bring that to your presentations, you would be amazing. And it turned out that what he lacked was the competence. He lacked competence, so he didn't have the confidence. So he didn't really understand what he was talking about. So it wasn't just his presentation skills. He needed to get an understanding about the subject matter and become a subject matter expert in what he was presenting on. And with that, the passion would come through and the skills would come through. So if we just worked on his skills, that would not have fixed the problem that he didn't really understand what he was talking about. But it wasn't until he was talking about something that he was excited about that that passion came through. And I said, see, you're sure, you just demonstrated you're capable of it. Now let's apply it in a different context. And he was like, wow, I never looked at it that way. And that's what he did. He worked on his knowledge and his skills continuously improved. So that's just one example um, that was just very recent. Well, what I love about that also is I think that you're pointing to, as coaches, helping our clients see themselves as integrating all the different components of themselves, yes. right? Yeah. Their passion from their hobbies, their passion with their family. I know some of the most moving shifts that I've had with my clients have been when they share stories about their kids or they share something about their personal life that they think is should be kept separate from their leadership work when it's actually the other way around it's like bringing their full humanity is what actually inspires others to feel psychologically safe to bring their full self to the work right yeah, you, you just reminded me of a story a real life coaching example from a few years ago one of my coaching clients got back on his 360 the fact that he never gave free feedback he never gave recognition. He only had complaints and criticism. And when I when we talked about that, he said, "I'm not their mother. My job isn't to hug them. Uh, my job is their job is I'm I'm paying them, right? They're getting a paycheck. They're supposed to meet the results and the relationship." And I said, "But they need the hugs. They need the recognition." I talked about the progress principle and the fact that they needed to feel a sense of achievement, but also recognition for that achievement. And he said, and I said, "Here's a real life example." How often do you hug your wife and kids? He said, every day. How often do you tell them that you love them? Every day. I said, what if you told your wife that you loved her on your anniversary and her birthday? So twice a year, performance reviews. And then for your kids, you did, you know, you, you gave them a hug quarterly. Um, and he actually almost started going into tears. And he said, yeah, that would be awful. I said, your employees need the hugs. They need, the, they need to know that you care about them, that they have your attention, that this is not just a, a business relationship, but, you know, as a leader. These are things you need to do. And he had never thought about it that before. He didn't realize that was part of his job and his role. And once he did, it wasn't overnight, but over time, he started to do it little by little. And their sense of engagement went up. Their productivity went up. Innovation went up. So they just needed that. They needed to feel like what they did mattered and that they were getting some recognition. And they, you know, we all want to feel the love, right? And they weren't feeling it from him. And so we kind of reframed it in the family way that you were just talking about. So that was a yeah. real, you know, that was a real transformation that, that we saw over like a three three to six month period. Do you think the work environment is changing around these kinds of things? And if so, what are the opportunities that you're seeing in terms of being, uh, you know, leaders or even coaches being able to implement these kinds of tools more effectively? Yeah, in the pandemic and post-pandemic world where yeah. people are hybrid and some people are in the office and other people are not, there's the proximity bias of are those in the office going to get preferential treatment or more attention than people who are working from home? So leaders need to be aware of that and make sure that they don't do that. Um, in terms of you know, the old style of MBWA, managing by walking around or leading by walking around, 
if people are not in the office, a leader can't stop by someone's desk and say, hey, how's your day going? Or pop into right. my office and let's talk. So you need to go a little out of your way. You need to be a little more proactive and keeping um, building those relationships and staying connected and seeing how people are feeling. Um, and there's all kinds of ways of doing that. One thing I do is I have a visual of all these emoji faces. And sometimes with my clients, I'll say, just pick one of these faces. How are you feeling today? What, what mood are you in? So while they might say, uh, they may not say, oh, I'm sad or I'm de depressed or I'm confused or whatever, but they may pick, you know, emoji number five in row two and point to that one and say, that kind of represents how I'm feeling. And I'm like, well, tell me about that. Why? Right. So I used a visual cue to trigger an emotion that helped them articulate what they were feeling. And then the why opens up the conversation to what's going on in your world. Right. They, that it's kind of a shortcut and it's visual. It's kind of fun, but it also it's a creative way of getting out from people. What are you thinking and feeling right now? And that, and that visual eye emoji will trigger that, that feeling and initiate that conversation. So that's another example of how I use visuals in my uh, coaching practice. And sometimes I'll actually have people draw, draw how you're feeling. Our friend Aisha Bursell, who wrote the book Design the Life You Love, which is right over my shoulder, she does an exercise called Draw How You're Feeling Right Now. And even if you have ICD, I Can't Draw Syndrome, you could draw a stick figure that represents, do you have a cloud over your head or is it a ray of sunshine, right? So there are ways of visually articulating how you're feeling, what you're thinking, and that serves as an opener to uh, these coaching conversations. Yeah, uh, I completely agree. I think I, I definitely have I can't draw syndrome, <laughs> but I remember being in situations where I was asked to draw a mandala, and almost anyone can draw a mandala because a mandala doesn't have to have it doesn't have to look like anything, right? It's just yeah. symbolic. But it's filled with meaning. It's filled with filled with symbolism. So yeah, I think it's a really powerful metaphor to get us out of our heads. Yeah, like an it's, example, like anyone could draw this kind of stick figure. It says, you know, how do you frame an idea and get it out of your head into someone else's so that they could say, I see what you're saying. There's no one here who couldn't with even if you have to trace it, you could draw this figure, right? So um drawing a Venn diagram, right? You could say, you know, this is visual leadership, right? It's the intersection of visual thinking and leadership. So Again, it's about thinking visually. Um, your fierce model, right, is a great framework that I love that breaks down into six categories, ways to think about leadership, right? So anytime right. you can create a model or a framework that will help people wrap their mind around it, they will be able to see it more clearly and then be able to use it, right? If you can't see it, it's very hard to implement something if you can't even remember it. So I always talk about attention, comprehension, and retention. When you use visual imagery or visual language, it gets people to focus, it increases understanding and helps them to remember. So I think you need to repeat that one. You went through it sure. really fast. Sure. <laughs> and now we only have 30 minutes, so I'm packing a lot of it. Yeah, no, no, no. That's, the, that's just really profound for all of us to have that at our fingertips. So give us yeah. those three again. Sure. It's A, C, and R. So attention, comprehension, right. and retention. So when you use visual, a story, a metaphor, a picture, it gets people's attention because you're looking at it, right? It's like, let me show you something. All right, now you have my attention. I'm focused. Because in today's world, think about how distracted we are with our phones and with chimes and email and text and Slack and every, all this information coming at us. So gets our attention, gets us to focus. Comprehension, it helps us to understand. If I explained how to get to my apartment in New York, you may not understand it. But if I show you a New York subway map and I'd say, take the Q train, the yellow line, which is color coding, by the way, is, is a great way to, to uh, communicate visually. If I say take the Q train, which is the yellow line from Times Square up to the Upper East Side, you can visualize that in your mind's eye in a way that if I just gave it to you verbally, you would not. And then in terms of retention, memory, and recall, um, we're just wired visually as humans. Our brains are wired that way. So we will remember something better. Um, and the, the science behind it, there's two theories. One is called the picture superiority effect which says that when words and images do battle, the pictures win. Just again, that's how we're wired. And then dual coding theory is that when we use images and words in combination, it's more powerful and more effective than either on their own. So this is just a little bit of the science behind it that a lot of people say, oh, is there science behind it or is this just theory? There is a lot of science behind this. No, yeah. it's really great. I think that the, what you're pointing to is so supportive of coaches that are looking at access routes for getting our clients to think out of so-called out of the box, literally, figuratively, right? Yeah. I mean, because creativity and innovation is going to be the key to our fixing the climate crisis. It's going to be key to our leveraging and engaging the next generation of younger leaders that are coming up. 
So that's what I loved about this work is that mm -hmm. when I was reading your book and when I speak to you, I'm always inspired to sort of get out of whatever framing that I have. And I notice mm -hmm. even I'm sort of standing and putting my hands on so breath. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Getting to think about visually, aesthetically, somatically, energetically, getting out of here and into a different sandbox, so to speak. So I really appreciate that you're sort of trying to break us in or make us more permeable that way. And then the science backs it up that we are more creative when we think in terms of images, when we think in terms of feelings, when we connect to something that resonates. So yeah. I really want to thank you for sharing this, um, these ideas, these constructs. I know you went through it super fast, but I think huh. it's, it's inspiring well, the, everyone the, to the look goodness. for more. The good news is, are we doing a webinar in June? A little plug here, a little. Uh, oh plans. right, yes, thank you. You so can plug it. Whole, we're doing a whole webinar on this in June. I forget the date off the top of my uh, my head, but uh, yes, so we're going to dive into this even more deeply for a full hour um, in in June. I forget the date. I don't have the date in front of me either, but at the Institute of Coaching org, you will find the date because it's already posted. And absolutely, thank you, Todd, for reminding me. We will it is have June, June 8th at 12 noon Eastern. I just checked, right. my old, just checked my old school visual calendar and it's right there. <laughs> Good for you. You're one step ahead of me every yeah. time. That is great to remind everyone to please join us because I've already learned so much about the frameworks and tools that we as coaches can employ through Todd's visual leadership, visual thinking to support our clients to really break out of whatever stuck places they are and, um, and use all of their capabilities to engage as leaders, to engage their teams, to take their whole organization to another level of success. So with that, I know we could talk all afternoon, but I'm just really, really happy that you took some time to be with us today. And I will look forward to seeing you in June. Thank you, and I want to thank all of you for being with us. All the folks from all over the world, please come back and join us in June. And you'll learn more from Todd. Thanks again, everyone. Take care.